We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 this morning, first of all, and then we're going to be jumping to a bunch of other scriptures this morning. So hopefully you have your Bible handy, and I get to hear a bunch of pages turning this morning, so I'm excited about that very thought. So if you would, let's begin reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. You can be seated. Uh, I guess you can see by what's down front on the communion table is today we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper is something that is a very special time in the church, and, and we set aside certain dates each, uh, each quarter to make sure we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We never want it to become something that is just uh, a ceremony and a ritual that we do, but we want to let you know. And so that's why weeks in advance I'll begin to tell you about it when it's coming up so that you can prepare your heart and, and do some things that the Scripture says to do. In fact, in that same Scripture, we find out that the Apostle Paul told the church of Corinth that when you do this and you observe this, uh, I want you to examine yourself. Make sure you're doing this with the right motive, with the right attitude. And so, uh, because they had brought in some uh, very bad things into their church, some of the corrupt uh, ways that they had previously worship their false idols, and so that's what they had begun to do, some of those kind of things in that church. And so Paul told them, as it comes this time, I want you to, to make sure that you're doing things the right way. But also he pointed out to them that uh, this is a memorialization. It's, uh, it's only one of the two ordinances of the church. The two, two ordinances of the church, and only two ordinances of the church, are baptism and and the Lord's Supper. And so the purpose of it is he says, you are showing something. You are memorializing something. You are this do in remembrance of me, in memorial of me, in thinking about me, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So the purpose, and I, I know this kind of is redundant, uh, but a memorialization is, and a memorial is nothing more than the purpose of remembering. That's, that's the time of reflection. When you see a memorial, uh, a lot of folks say, well, that's set up in honor of something. Well, possibly, but in essence, what it's really trying to get you to do is whatever that statue or that memorial or that plaque or whatever, it's, it's trying to get you to memorialize a time, a, a, an event possibly, to get you to look back at some things and to bring some things into mind. And so as we start looking at this idea, it, we found out that it's also a proclamation that this particular memorialization not only is to bring back some things to our mind that we already know, it's just a time to reflect and think again on them, but it's a proclamation that this is a new covenant. We don't live under the old covenant anymore. That this is the, the blood covenant. This is the covenant of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the covenant that is under, thank God, grace and mercy and not the law. And then we find out that it's also not just a proclamation, but it's also a manifestation. He said that you're showing something. You are showing the Lord's death. You are saying that I agree with what Jesus said. And what Jesus said is, this is my body, this was given for you, it was, it was my, my blood that was shed for you, and you are saying, I believe that. I believe that Jesus Christ, substitution in my stead, died for me. I believe that Jesus died for my sin. I believe that I could not overcome the wages of sin, which is death. But Jesus in my place and in my stead, every time I observe the Lord's Supper, I'm saying, I believe Jesus died for me. 
And it's easy to look around and say, well, Jesus died for the world. Jesus died for you. But it's also a revelation. He says, you are showing Jesus' death until he come. You are admitting something every time you take the Lord's Supper. You're admitting this might be the last time I ever do this. You're admitting that one day what he said about his death is true. But what he said about his resurrection is true. And what we saw in his ascension is true. And what he has said he's going to do is return and take us to a place called heaven with him. And I believe that is true. So every time you take the Lord's Supper, you are preaching one more good sermon. And all you got to do is chew and swallow. And that's the best testimony there is. Because you're saying, I believe. I believe in the death of Jesus Christ. I believe in His burial and I believe in His resurrection. I believe in His ascension and I believe in His second coming. I believe I am going to be with Him one day through all of eternity. All of that is said in that quiet moment called communion. And Paul said, that's why, Church of Corinth, I want you to stop and think about it. I want you to examine your heart. Just, just slow down a minute, church. It's okay. TV will wait. Jaguars aren't winning anyway. Florida State's not even showing up for their games. And I'm glad they play on Saturday because I can cry all day Sunday. We, we, there's so many other things that are driving our attention. But get, slow down. Take a deep breath. Remember me. Just for a moment this morning, I want to remember him. Now, what I want to do this morning is in a different way. I don't want to just kind of go through all the, the history of Jesus because uh, that is one of the ways we oftentimes do it. But I, I want to today just kind of look back and remember him for who he said he was. You remember he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they gave all kind of answers, didn't they? <laughs> they, even, they even believed in, you might be John the Baptist, come back to life. They would believe in reincarnation, but they won't believe in resurrection. Amen? Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're that prophet. Some say, well, who do you say that I am? And thank God they said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, who did Jesus say he was? And, and what terminologies did he use? So this morning I want to share with you seven times. You now know how long the outline is. Take a deep breath because I had 14. It's going to be a two-parter, amen? So I'm going to look at this for the next two weeks about what Jesus said that we, as we are remembering him this morning. I want to remember him as there was a fire one day coming out of a little shrub in the desert and Moses was talking to it <laughs> and Moses said Lord they're not gonna believe this <laughs> I need a name Lord who shall I say sent me and the Lord God told Moses in the book of Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 I am that I am and he said thou shalt say unto the children of Israel I am hath sent me unto you that has become the unspeakable name of God, I Am. I've shared with you on numerous occasions how the, the Jews would not even, and still today, don't like to use the word I Am or Am. When they say Abraham, they breathe it because they don't want to speak the name of God in vain. They call him Abraham. They don't like to, for fear of saying I Am in the Hebrew tongue. But Jesus on seven occasions said I Am. Actually, two more than that, but only as seven times as an illustration. In the time that we're going to look this morning, I want to remember him. Because he said, I am the bread of life. In John chapter number 6, verse number 31, the disciples are talking to Jesus, and they said, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. 
For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Amen. And Jesus said unto them, I am. Oh, did he just say the unspeakable name of God? I am the bread of life. And he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that uh, cometh to me shall never thirst. Later on, after that phrase, just a few verses down, it says, And the Jews then murmured after him, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. In verse 48, they're still talking a little bit, and Jesus interrupts them and says, I am the bread of life. And he said, Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness. And they're dead. They ate heaven bread. They ate bread that God sent from heaven. But it was turned into a physical bread to sustain them physically. And guess what? Everyone who ate manna is dead. Then he says, This is the bread that cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever, and the bread that I shall give him is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. <laughs> and just around that same time, there were two loaves and a couple of fish, right? But what are they among so many? Or five loaves and two fish. And what are they among so many? And he fed 5,000 people. And you know what? The next day, they were coming to seek him. You know why? They were hungry. God had supplied something special for them, but it was physical. And they have a physical problem and a physical need. But he said, if you partake of me, I am the bread of life. Do you understand something about that bread of life? It is a person. He says, I am, twice. It wasn't like he had a, a slip of tongue and they went, ooh, he, he didn't really mean to say that. So the second time he says it, he doesn't say it in a sentence. He just interrupts what they're saying and says, I am the bread of life. I am. I am that bread. Think of him this morning. Remember him, that he's the bread of life. Remember he will sustain you. Remember that that bread has power. It has the power to save. He said, if you will eat this, you will never die. It has a promise. It is a person. It has power. It has promise. These verses tell us that a bread from heaven will give man eternal life. It will meet more than just physical needs. Churches need to remember that in this day and time. Some folks get a little offended with this, but you have to understand something. Jesus sent us to win people to Christ, not to feed them. Well, brother, talk to my boss. I'm all for helping folks out when you can help folks out. I bet me and Brother Paul have answered that answer machine back there more than we could ever imagine. Well, I'm passing through town. And we need, and we need, and we need, and we want. I've had them stop at the church, and I've taken food out of the, out of the pantry, and I've had them say stuff like, was that all you got? Well, my baby needs, okay, let's meet me down at Circle K, you know, the Middleburg Ball. I'll buy some diapers. Oh, no, you just give us the money. No, nah, not going to happen. But our true calling is the bread of life. Because if I feed them today, they're going to be hungry tomorrow. And I'll have a good conscience. I got them a little further up the road in their misery. But if I give them Jesus, they will never die. And then they'll have the Holy Spirit of God giving them wisdom on the inside, and they might soon find themselves out of that kind of predicament. You see, Jesus said, remember me. 
because I am the bread of life. He secondly said, remember me because I'm the light of the world. Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. We live in a dark world, don't we? Why are we stumbling? Because we're trying to use a flashlight instead of a spotlight. We're trying to use our own wisdom and our own light and our own discernment when God says, I am the light of the world. Jesus said, if you walk with me, did you catch that? If you follow me, you will not walk in darkness. Because he's leading the way with the light. Our problem is we're in front of the light casting a shadow. And where we're walking is dark with light around the sides of us. No wonder it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. One step at a time. Let's just go this far. You know the very first act of God in creation? And God said, Let there be light. And what did that light do, the Bible said? It separated the darkness from the light. What did Jesus do when he came into the world? He separated darkness from light. He, in the Gospel of John, showed us that I am the light of the world, and he that comes with me, even in this satanic ruled world, where Satan is the prince and the power of the air, where things are, are confusing and things are darkened and things are not going the way of right, I can give you light. The difference is, will you follow it? You know, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Did, did you catch that? If you know the right thing to do, but you choose the dark way instead of the light way, you're sinning against God. This morning I want you to remember Jesus as the light of the world. You ever notice what happens when you turn the light on? <laughs> the cockroaches scatter, amen? They don't like the light. They run. You notice what happens when you turn the light on, ladies? And they, no wonder they call them vanity mirrors, amen? They put them lights all around those things. My question is, why? You don't want to see that. You know why I know that? Because you're covering it up, amen? Why? Because you don't like to see the imperfections that you think are in your face. You see all of a sudden a stray little hair in your eyebrow and you, you, done, you done think you're the ugliest thing on the face of the earth. You're a beautiful woman. Don't, don't let the things of this world convince you any different. But yet we do. Why? Because the closer we get to the light, the more imperfections we see. You see, don't go to a vanity light. Go to the true light. And you will see what we are. Sinners saved by grace. I am the light of the world. I did not, he did not come, please understand this, he did not come to point out your failures. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. And he does so as the bread of life. He does so as the light of the world. Remember him. He is the light of the world. Remember him thirdly when he says, I am the door. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. By the way, didn't say he didn't get in. Just said he didn't change by going another way. You see, you can get in the sheepfold, but if you don't go by the door, you're not a sheep. You're a thief and a robber. In fact, he'll go on in the same portion of Scripture to say, and he comes but to do one thing, 
steal, kill, and destroy. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and he leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were that he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily. By the way, Jesus did not have a speech impediment. Whenever Jesus says something twice, he means, Listen up, listen up. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. And all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Verse number 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter, he shall be saved, and he shall go in and out and find pasture. Did you hear what he said to you this morning? I'm the door. The door. Not a door. Not one of the windows. <laughs> Not a rotating, revolving door. I am the door. And if you're going to get in the sheepfold then you've got to come through the door. That's it. There's an old little children's church song called One Door and Only One, but the sides are two, inside and outside. <laughs> Which side are you? Amen. That's it. You either go through Jesus Christ or you do not enter. That's simple. Remember Him. He's the bread of life that satisfies your soul, that you'll, your soul will never hunger after anything else. If your soul begins to hunger after something else, after you made a confession or profession or a speech, something's wrong. Because your soul got saved. Because there's only one way in. If you're depending on anything else to get you to heaven, there is no other way. There's just the door. Jesus said, I am the door. He's using the, the illustration of a sheepfold. And what's amazing is he just said that the shepherd goes in through the door and he calls his sheep by name and his sheep know his voice. Why is it you could be in a very crowded place and hear the word, Mom, and know if it's your child or not? Because you recognize their voice. Isn't that amazing? Jesus said, oh, they know my voice. You see, sometimes we get so cluttered up with all the other noise, we don't hear our shepherd. But that doesn't mean he's not calling. And that he hasn't given you the ability to hear. Because he's allowed you to come through the door. In that next set of verses, he does another statement. He says in John chapter 10, verse number 9, he said, I am the door. Verse number 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. While we're standing here at the sheepfold, and while I've got your mind interested in going in the door, and while I've got you thinking about being one of the sheepfold, while I've got you thinking about that, let me point out the shepherd to you. Because every one of you Jews knows that special psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. And he says, I am the good shepherd. Well, what, what's the good shepherd do, Jesus? The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catches them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling, and cares not for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. There's that little word again. No. That's that intimate word. 
That's that relationship word. It's not a head knowledge. It's an intimate where two become one. Physically, it's in refer reference to the husband-wife relationship. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she bare a son. And Jesus will say one day, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And here he says to his sheep, I know my sheep. I'm at one with my sheep. And am I known by my sheep? There's a confidence between me and the sheep, for I am their shepherd. And watch this. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. You don't think Jesus is one with the Father? He even says it later on. I am the Father of one. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Of the sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and shall one fold become with one shepherd. Therefore, watch this, Doth my Father love me? Now think of all the ways that God the Father could love God the Son. He's perfect. He's holy. He's one with Him. He's part of Him. He's part of the Godhead. Oh, why else would you love Him? Because I lay down my life that I might take it again. The Father loved the Son because in eternity past, he was slain before the foundations of the world. Before there ever was a sinner, there was a Savior. And Jesus said, I am that shepherd. And because I lay down and take up my life for you, my Father loves me. Jehovah Roy, I am the good shepherd. We then notice as he says something at the end of that, he says in John chapter 10 that I'm the good door to the sheepfold. I'm the only one. Then in John chapter 10, he says, I'm also the shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep that I might, what? Take it up again. Then in John chapter 11, guess what he says? Jesus said unto her, talking about Mary and, and Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Let me ask you a question this morning. You attended any funerals lately? Way too many, amen? Do you believe if you trust in Jesus Christ as the bread, the door, do you, do you believe that if you trust in Jesus Christ as the light of the world, do you, do you believe if you believe that he's the good shepherd who laid down his life? Do you believe you won't die? Well, you know, Brother Rick, I, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. But wait, believest thou this? You really believe that? Where's he standing? He's at Lazarus' tomb. They just said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. He's at a dead man's place. And what's he say? Lazarus, come forth. And he does. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, we should come into the world. What's the difference between life and death? Believing in the good shepherd. That the good shepherd, the I am the good shepherd, is the I am the resurrection. Notice he didn't say I am a resurrection and I will be resurrected and I can help people be resurrected. He said I am the resurrection. Without Jesus Christ, there is no resurrection. And then he says, passing on, he comes to that 13th chapter of the Gospel of John. And in that 13th chapter, 12th and 13th chapters, he's beginning to get things ready because he's getting ready to die. And he's having the final Passover. And it's in those two chapters that we find out that this is where Jesus Christ 
does what we are going to do this morning. He tells his disciples, Take, this is my body. Take, this is my blood. This do in remembrance of me. And after they walk out, they're on their way. Jesus notices their face. And he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there ye may be also. Thomas kicked in and said, Lord, I'm, I'm not sure where you're going and, and the way you're going. So Jesus said to them, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That one is packed. I am the way. He's not just the door. He's the, he's the road to the door. He's not just the door to the sheepfold. He's the shepherd at the sheepfold. He's not just the shepherd who gave his life. He's the shepherd who rose again to bring new life. And so he says to them, I am the way. I am the truth. Do you realize Jesus never told a lie? He cannot. We studied that on Wednesday nights, didn't we? Is it possible for him? No, he couldn't. Not that he didn't, he wouldn't, he couldn't. Think about that. Let that sink in for just a little while on that noggin. He's truth. Everything about him is true. Everything, every thought, every motion, every, every breath is truth. And it brings to you and me life. Remember him tonight or this morning. Because He is the way, the truth, and the life. And as they walked a little bit further, getting closer to Gethsemane, where He will in just a few moments pray, not my will, but thine be done. They're walking through a garden, and He looks to the side. And He looks to His disciples and says, Oh, by the way, I'm the true vine. And my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine... No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine. There he, he says each one of them two times, just in case you didn't catch it. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth, watch this one, much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Do you understand what he just said about being the vine and we're the branches? That in this life that's going on, day by day, moment by moment, we are abiding in Him. He is abiding into us. And we that are His will bear fruit. Then the Father takes that and cuts back a little bit. We don't like that. It, uh, by the way, I'll tell you, it's no fun when the Lord trims you up, amen? Cuts back some. He purges it. Why? Because now I can bear more fruit. And as my life goes on and on and on, there will come a time in my life that I'm bearing much fruit. And here's why. For without me, you can do nothing. I'm the vine. I'm your everything. I'm your source. I'm your nutrition. I'm your guidance. I'm everything that makes you. Everything that's coming out in your life, whether it's a little fruit, more fruit, or much fruit. 
None of it's because of you. By the way, how's your basket looking? Got fruit? You want some more fruit? How about let's do much fruit? You see, Jesus said, I am. And I want you this morning, as we get ready to observe the Lord's Supper, I want you to think and remember him. I am. He is Jehovah God. They are one. And just in case you're wondering how old he was, he says, before Abraham was, I am. That's a whole lot more than 33. That's eternity. Eternity past and eternity future. He is the great I am. And every one of those I am's are for you. Because I am, you are. Everything that you are is due to him. Take a deep breath. Relax, church. Remember him. Remember him. Tyson, if you would, come.